Good morning. morning. We're talking about prayer, and um, let me just start with a question. What are some things you pray about most often? What do you pray about most often? Okay, family, people being sick, healing. Okay, healing, family, people being sick. What else? Is what? Praises. Okay. Okay, to exchange his yoke with mine because I kind of worry about everything. So in exchange, my worries for your peace. Good. What else? The church. Yeah, we pray mo- most, I mean, right now, praying about our church. Good. What else? Money issues, finances. Take, to get a deeper relationship with him. Anything else? Guidance, the condition of our world. What do you pray about most often? Talking, just talking to Jesus. Good. About good things, yes. I'm not surprised that I didn't really hear anybody say confession. That one of the one of our most common prayers is confession. That didn't really surprise me. I didn't expect that we would uh, come here and, and say, at least many of us say, my most common prayer is confession. And so we're going to talk a little bit today about what is a prayer of confession um, in this. And I think sometimes we we take confession as something, and we just kind of maybe a subconscious or just part of the way we do things as Christians or as a church, is that confession is kind of, well, it's kind of like a one-time deal, right? Like I, at some point in my life when I come to this realization that I'm a sinner and need uh, uh, the, the salvation from, from God through Jesus Christ, that I confess that. I confess I'm a sinner. I confess I need Jesus. And then that's supposed to be a one-time deal. Now, most of us know that we mess up sometimes, and we, maybe, maybe it's a couple-of-time deal through our life. And that's kind of what we think of confession. But I think it's deeper than that. It's, it's something much more important. Well, that's probably the most important thing is to do that, to get in this relationship with Christ. But it's, a, it's an ongoing thing. And so we're going to look at that today as we continue our kind of series where we're looking at four intriguing characters in the Bible and their, their prayer lives. Um, last week we looked at Habakkuk. And um, Habakkuk gave us the idea of a prayer for hope and a prayer for thanksgiving. And um, we, we all need to be praying that kind of prayer. And today we're going to look at Daniel. And what does it look, look like to be a person who is a prayer of confession? So who's got your Bibles? Yeah. Turn to Daniel chapter 9, if you have your Bibles. And if you don't, you can please take one from the book rack and use that Bible. Daniel chapter 9 will be on page 675 if you use the book rack Bible. And also if you're using your, your app on your phone or your tablet, on version, if you use that Bible app, um, we do have the uh, live event on there for Oakland Church of God, which has the outline and the notes and video clips and what all that kind of goes with our talk today. Um, Daniel, we kind of know his story. At least there's this one part that's really famous, right? We know about Daniel in the lion's den, don't we? I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the story of Daniel. And now, if you remember why Daniel got thrown in the lion's den, it had everything to do with prayer, right? Daniel was a person of prayer. He believed in God, Yahweh, the creator God, the one God, the God of Israel, the God of the Jews. And um, he was taken away with all of his people, or most of his people, as captives into Babylon. He was in Babylonian exile. And while he was there, he kept praying to God, Yahweh. And they passed a law, because mainly it was out of jealousy from these other leaders who weren't, uh, they were Babylonians, and they saw that Daniel was being blessed and they passed a law where no one could pray to anybody except the king. And the king said, that sounds good to me. Stamped his stamp of approval on it. Daniel said, I'm just going to pray to my God like I always do. And so he got taken and thrown into the lion's den. And there's our Sunday school story. Daniel goes in the lion's den. The angel of God comes and shuts the mouths of the lions. The king comes and says, oh, Daniel, are you okay? And Daniel's like, here I am. <laughs> I'm cool. So the king throws in the bad guys. They get eaten by the lions before they hit the floor. Daniel comes out, and then the story we're going to read, uh, this prayer we're going to read, kind of takes place right after that. Actually, right after that, um, it says that Daniel prospered. The, the Bible says Daniel prospered, and he was still in captivity. So he was prospering, but he was still a slave, for all, for all basic understanding of what he was doing in life. And all of Israel was in captivity, as they had broken their covenant with God, and that is why. God had removed his hand of blessing and protection off of them because they had broken the covenant. They had made an agreement. You be God and we'll be your people. And God said, okay, this is what it looks like. I will be this God and you will be this people. And they had pretty much came to this place where they said, well, we kind of don't want to do that anymore. We kind of want to do things our way instead of taking it to you, God. 
And so God took his hand off, and now they were in exile. And during this time, Daniel began to have visions and dreams as a part of his prayer life. So he turns, he was so, so deeply troubled, he turns to studying his Bible. And one of the things he had to study was the prophet Jeremiah. And he read the prophet Jeremiah, and as he did, he began to understand some things. Uh, and, and this is why he prayed his prayer. Jeremiah opened up his eyes to what God's plan was. So throughout his story, we see Daniel is a man of prayer, as highlighted here in Daniel chapter 9. In the first year of the, king, of the reign of King Darius of the, the Mede, the son of Ahasuerus, and I just love that name, it's like a dinosaur who goes around saying, Aha! Aha! A king Ahasuerus became king of the Babylonians. During the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, learned from reading the word of the Lord as revealed to the prophet Jeremiah that Jerusalem must be desolate for 70 years. So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and fasting. I also wore rough burlap and sprinkled myself with ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed. Here is the prayer of confession. O oh Lord, you are great and an awesome God. You always fulfill your covenant and keep your promises of unfailing love to those who love you and obey your commands. But we have sinned and done wrong. We have rebelled against you and scorned your commands and regulations. We have refused to listen to your servants, the prophets, who spoke on, our, on your authority to our kings and princes and ancestors and to all the people of the land. Lord, you are in the right. But as you see, our faces are covered with shame. This is true of all of us, including the people of Judah and Jerusalem and all Israel, scattered near and far, wherever you have driven us because of our disloyalty to you. O oh Lord, we, are, we and our kings, princes, and ancestors are covered with shame because we have sinned against you. But the Lord our God is merciful and forgiving, even though we have been rebelled, we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the Lord our God, for we have not followed the instructions he gave to us through the servants, the prophets. All Israel has disobeyed your instruction and turned away, refusing to listen to your voice. So now the solemn curses and judgments written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured down on us because of our sin. You have kept your word and done to us and our rulers exactly as you warned. Never has there been such a disaster that has happened in Jerusalem. Every curse written against us in the law of Moses has come true. Yet we have refused to seek mercy from the Lord our God by turning from our sins and recognizing his truth. Therefore, the Lord has brought us upon us the disaster he prepared. The Lord our God was right to do all of these things, for we did not obey him. O oh Lord our God, you brought lasting honor to your name by rescuing your people from Egypt in a great display of power. But we have sinned and are full of wickedness. In view of all your faithful mercies, Lord, please turn your furious anger away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain. All the neighboring nations mock Jerusalem and your people because of our sin and the sins of our ancestors. O oh, our God, hear your servant's prayer. Listen as I plead. For your own sake, Lord, smile again on your desolate sanctuary. Oh, my God, lean down and listen to me. Open your eyes and see our despair. See how our city, the city that bears your name, lies in ruins. We make this plea, not because we deserve help, but because of your mercy. Oh, Lord, hear, oh, Lord. Forgive, oh, Lord. Listen and act. For your own sake, do not delay. Oh, my God, for your people, and your city bear your name. Let's pray. Father, we love you. And today we come before you reading this ancient text, a prayer from Daniel, someone we know as a hero of the faith, someone who, who stood by and, and kept his commitment to pray to you and you alone when everyone else went their own way. And here, Lord, Daniel calls out a prayer of confession. And Lord, today we, we read it and we'll study it and we'll look at some, some things that maybe we'll learn from it. But Lord, may we most of all learn to pray and depend upon you and confess to you. Lord, we need you. Every hour we need you. That's our confession. Every minute and every day we need you. Lord, bring our eyes into focus on you and keep our eyes focused on you. And when the world distracts us, 
when the enemy tries to take us out, when our own desires and our own fleshly nature tries to rise up, Holy Spirit, come and keep our focus on you. May we see Jesus. May we allow you, Holy Spirit, to empower us to be like Jesus. Jesus, may we take your name and make it even more famous in our world by what we say and how we live. And may we live to honor you. And we confess that we have to have a Savior to do that. And we have to have the Holy Spirit's power to do this. We thank you, Lord, that you hear and answer our prayers. And so we're asking you this morning, as we acknowledge you are their teacher here, that you would help us to learn and understand and apply this passage of Scripture, your word, with the strength of your Holy Spirit to our lives, to our family, to our jobs, to our schools, to our church. Because, Lord, ultimately, if we belong to you, all of this is yours. May there be no separation. May we say we are completely, wholeheartedly all in. And Jesus is the subject. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. Um, you should have been handed an outline when you came in this morning. I would encourage you to use that as I give you a few things about confession and prayer and um, what a prayer of confession uh, really is about. And I'll start with this, the big idea. Confession is not a one-time act. Confession is not a one-time act, but a lifestyle of seeking God's way. That's what confession really is. Not a one-time act, but a lifestyle of seeking God's way. Let's start with a definition. Confession is coming into agreement. That's ultimately what confession is. To, is coming into agreement. Uh, I've told the story a couple of times, and some of you will remember of me telling Shelly I love you for the first time. And uh, stop laughing. <laughs> we'd, been date, we'd become best friends, and we'd been dating a while, and began getting romantic, and, and then like you do. And um, we, there was one evening, and we were there, and, and it was just the right, I was just feeling it, and I was just, it just hit me. I really am in love with this redhead. And I said, I love you. And my heart's going, duh, 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 duh. my palms are sweaty, and I'm like, uh. And she says, okay. <laughs> and I was just kind of, I mean, you can imagine. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and it took a little while for her to come into agreement with that confession. My confession was, I am, I'm saying something you may or may not know. And she came into agreement with that at some point, that love with, with her. And could it be for us, maybe the struggle, maybe the struggle is we're more interested in a God who agrees with us than us coming into agreement with God? I mean, could that be part of our struggle? That we, in reality, we are more interested in finding a God who agrees with us than actually coming into agreement with God. Daniel had been studying God's Word, which is what we should all be doing. He was studying God's word, spoken through Jeremiah, and he noted something. It was there. He found this passage, this prophecy, that the people of God would shortly return to Jerusalem, that God's plan was to bring them back out of their exile, out of the slavery, out of the bondage, and restore them and redeem them and make all things new. That's what God's plan has been ever since it began. And as he read this, he, he realized something. He, he was grieved, and he came to God in prayer because he said, I see this is your plan and I'm begging for mercy because these people aren't interested in returning to you, God. He says, it's grieving me and I'm confessing. I'm trying to come on behalf of the people because they're not interested in coming back to you and your plan is that we would come back to you and this is the time. The time is approaching. So his, his prayer isn't some ritual. He's not coming out of a sense of duty that, okay, this is prayer time that I'm just going to come and kneel down in prayer now. Daniel came to God because he was in a relationship with God. That's why he came to God and called upon his mercy. In prayer, we come into agreement with who God is. That's ultimately what confession is all about. Coming into agreement with who God is. That's confession. That's where it begins. And I think we skip over that sometimes. Daniel begins his prayer with worship and adoration. We should begin our prayer with worship and adoration. I'm in agreement. God, you are awesome. Our God is an awesome God. That is coming into agreement with who God is. We're not telling him something he doesn't know. He knows he's awesome. <laughs> we're saying we're coming into agreement. We're acknowledging who you are. You're the creator of the universe. You spoke this world into existence. We adore you for this. We're coming into agreement with who you are. 
he has an awareness of the presence of God. And in his awareness of the presence of God, he agrees, Oh Lord, you are great. You are awesome. We pray a prayer of confession every time we pray and acknowledge, Lord, you are the creator. Lord, you are the sustainer. You're God. You absolutely are holy, holy, holy. That's in coming into agreement with who God is. That's confession. There is nothing beyond your reach. Here's the thing about Jesus. He is not so far beyond us that he is not with us. Jesus is not so far beyond us that he is not with us. We have sometimes this idea of praying to a God, praying to a Jesus who is up here, out there somewhere, and he is here with us. God inclines to us. He reaches down to us. He leans into us when we call to him. That's who he is. He leans in to get closer, offering his intimate love, offering his compassion. He is worthy to be adored. He is worthy. You cannot experience this until you come into agreement with who God is. When you come into agreement with who he is, you can't help but adore him. You can't help but love him. You can't help but live in a a lifestyle of worship of him because he is ultimately the only one worthy of that worship. Also, a prayer of confession is an act of surrender. A prayer of confession is also an act of surrender. In confession, we're giving up stuff that we've been hanging on to. As we come into agreement with God, we find ourselves bringing along with us stuff and then offering it, surrendering it. Stuff that we've been hanging on to. And Daniel doesn't gloss over anything in this prayer. He's like, God, we've blown it. We deserve, we don't deserve your mercy. We deserve what's happening to us. He doesn't gloss over anything. We blew it. We messed up everything. We have sin here, God, is what he prays. We've been hanging on to our selfish ways and our false idols for a long, long, long time. Daniel surrenders to God's will. And he prays, It's our fault, God. You are right to bring discipline to us when the covenant is broken, because when the covenant is broken, guess who broke it? Not God. It's us. Most of the time, we simply need to surrender ourselves in a prayer of confession. You are God, and I'm not. That's the ultimate prayer of confession. That's how I start every day, and I pray that you would too. Many times when we pray over our offering and the joy of giving, we'll acknowledge, you're God and money is not. That is why we are offering this. That's why we are bringing this offering. Because you're God and money is not. We're confessing. We're coming to agreement with God that He is God. A confession is not a one-time act, but a lifestyle of seeking God's way, day by day, step by step, coming into agreement with God. And confession is revealed in repentance. Confession is coming into agreement with God, and confession is revealed in repentance. Repentance is um, something that we need to do on a regular basis also, just like confession. And sometimes it almost feels like we're being forced into repentance. Kind of watch like this video. So even professional wrestlers need repentance, and sometimes they have to force it on each other. It's kind of like the great theologian M.C. Hammer says, I tried and tried and tried to make a way, but nothing happened till the day that I prayed. That's what this is about. So Daniel prays, we have sinned, we have been wrong, we have been wicked, we have rebelled, we have turned away from God, from your laws, from your ways, from your very presence. We have not listened to your messengers, the prophets. We've been unfaithful. We've not prayed. We have not repented. This is his prayer. He's praying all this. Daniel doesn't want there to be any misunderstanding that the community of faith has blown it. And he just, he doesn't just admit it. He says, this is it. He's confessing. It's not just an admission. It's a confession. I'm agreeing with you, God. We've got to change. We're going to not just admit we're wrong, but we're committing to change. That's what repentance is turning, going the other way. Repentance literally is to change the mind and direction. That's what repentance literally is, changing the mind and direction. And it's not just going a different way, but it's going from my way, our way, then turning. It's 180 degrees of what it means, and going God's way. That's exactly what the word repentance means. And he's conf- confession and repentance go hand in hand. I come into agreement with God because as I do, I turn towards him, not just turning away from self, and not just turning away from sin, not just turning away from anything, but turning to God. That is repentance and following him. 
It means more than saying, well, I messed up. Well, I messed up. <laughs> Repentance means a change in direction. Like you didn't just say, well, I messed up and keep doing it. Jesus, when he healed people and told them they were sins were forgiven, he said, go and sin no more. I don't find any point where he says, go and just keep being a sinner who sins every day like everybody else. He says, go and sin no more. Whatever we need to do, turn from. Whatever we need to turn from, we need to turn to God. A prayer of confession reveals that you can't just admit it, your actions, which is hard enough for any of us to do, to admit our actions are wrong. That's hard enough. Repentance means you have to actually change something. Something's gotta, there's got to be follow-up. Confession isn't an apology. I'm sorry, that's not a confession. Confession is I'm coming into agreement that I was wrong. And I'm not saying I'm sorry, but I'm coming to agreement that God is right. And then repentance. I'm actually doing something about it. I'm making a change. I'm making a turn and going with God. Daniel confesses in verse 11, all Israel has disobeyed your instruction and turned away. See, that's how it is with God. It's a family. It's a community. And if one or two have the sin in the camp, guess who gets all of the repercussions? The whole camp. That's a, that's a part of being the family of God. It's a one body, one body of God with many different parts. And all the parts pay different many, many things to do. But there's one body. And when one part suffers, the whole body suffers. And this is what what Daniel's talking about. He's saying, all of Israel has sinned. There's probably a few people going, wait a minute, I didn't, Daniel. Daniel said, yep, we're all part of the same family. We're all part of the same tribe. We've turned away. Now we're turning back to you, God. We're sorry we quit listening to your voice and we're ready to listen again. We're ready to listen again. Jesus talks about listening to his voice. In John chapter 10, he's talking about the shepherd and the gatekeeper and the sheep. And he says these words, The one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep recognize his voice and come to him. He calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. After he has gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them, and they follow him because they know his voice. They won't follow a stranger. They will run from him because they don't know his voice. Those who heard Jesus use this illustration didn't understand what he meant, so he explained it to them. I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who come before me, uh, came before me were thieves and robbers, but the true sheep did not listen to them. Jesus is saying, back in Daniel's time, they were, you guys refused to listen to the voice of God. Now he's saying, if you're going to follow the voice of God, you listen to Jesus. You know his voice and you follow him as your shepherd. When you pray a prayer of confession, you begin to know the voice of Jesus. When you come into agreement with God, you begin to know and understand the voice of Jesus. And that, that doesn't mean you always will hear some out, out loud voice. You might. Most likely you feel, you feel it. You hear it in your heart. You understand it, that Jesus is speaking to you, and you listen and you follow him. Second Chronicles 7.14 tells us that God says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and restore their land. And often we pray, oh God, restore our land. Restore your people. And we don't do the first part. Humble themselves. That's a, not, uh, that's a, that's a posture of kneeling, face down before God, humbling. And pray and seek his face. Seek his face. And in order to do that, you have to turn from your wicked ways. And then, he says, I will hear, I will forgive, and I will heal. See, confession and repentance lead to healing, lead to wholeness, lead to restoration, lead to salvation. God doesn't ask us to confess because he's trying to humiliate us. That's a, that's a problem we have, I think, sometimes in, in churches. We feel like, well, if I go down and confess something, I feel like we're going to feel humiliated. What are they going to think? What are they going to think? What is somebody else going to think? And that is not God's plan. It's not the way he works at all. He, we kid ourselves when we do that. And our perspective gets distorted and we're dishonest with ourselves about our own righteousness. Well, you know, I don't want to do this because God might humiliate me. We must come into agreement with our dependence on God. I need him. I need God in my life. I need Jesus Christ. I depend on God. We need to pray that. We need to pray. We need to depend upon God and depend on Him to forgive our sins and heal our lands. It's time for repentance. 
time to stop simply talking about the importance of prayer and live it. That's what it's time for. If we're ever going to get past the status quo, we've got to become a house of prayer. If it's ever going to happen, each one of us has to become a house of prayer. Collectively, a local congregation, Oakland Church has got to become a house of prayer collectively. God's church, regardless of what kind of names and denominations and tribes are on signs around town, have got to put all that aside and come together as a house of prayer. Then we'll begin to see some things happen. What we'll begin to see is what, confu- what confession brings. Confession leads to unity. Confession, coming into agreement with God, repenting and turning to God, brings unity. It leads to unity. We'll show you a couple of pictures, and some of these have been popping up the last couple of weeks in our little intro video we made. This is a, a picture from one of our pastor's prayer guys. Actually, that was here. Um, we took pictures at several of these, and they, this is going on. Um, anywhere from 30 to 60 pastors from churches in Hot Springs gather every week and pray. And right, this was a while back. Right here, we prayed, and they gathered around me and, and prayed. And we do that every, every church we go to, gather around the pastor, and then break in small groups and pray for each other. Um, three or four pastors in a group pray, and then we come together and just cry out to God together. Um, there's one more, I think. Yeah, this is a neat picture, and I think I've showed it before, but obviously you have Father George, who is the Catholic priest here in town, um, one of them. And on the other side, this young man here, his name is Dave, and he's the Lutheran pastor. And you may or may not know the church history, but you know, Pastor Steve sitting in the middle of a, between a Lutheran pastor and a Catholic priest is a, it's a little bit kind of like, wow, what in the world? Because the, the Lutheran church is really about broke off the Protestant movement from the Catholic church when Martin Luther nailed his thesis to the, to the thing. And I was sitting there going, man, this is crazy. What is God doing? What he's doing is we came together confessing there's one church and one Lord. And yes, we have some differences in the way we do some things and the way we kind of interpret some things. But there is one Lord and one Jesus and he has one mission and that's to bring all people into salvation to him. And when we make that confession, you know what's begun to happen? Unity. Unity's begun to happen. And it's, it's amazing. It's beautiful. And I pray that continues on and on and on and on and on. Because uh, could it be that one of our, our spiritual enemy's greatest weapons that he uses is to divide the body of Christ? I mean, could that, could that be the reality of it? Think about it. If we're united, aren't we an unstoppable force that can do anything to the glory of God? When, isn't, when you think about the body of Christ, with, empowered by the Holy Spirit, with eyes focused completely on Jesus, and Jesus truly is the subject, not some cliche, not some, some, some little motto, but the actual reality that we live by, that everything we do is because Jesus is the subject, that's an unstoppable force. And that is God's plan. That is God's plan. Unity for the sake of God's kingdom as Daniel prays. That's what he prays for. Unity for the sake of God's kingdom. He says, verse 17, for your own sake, Lord, for your sake, not for us, for your sake, smile again on your desolate sanctuary. Not for us. We don't deserve it. Bring us to the joy of unity for your sake, God, for your glory, for your kingdom. And he continues, please, God, listen to me. See our despair. See how we lie in ruins. And then when we pray a prayer of confession of unity, we make this plea. He prays for, goes from, I'm praying to you and asking for this, I'm confessing this to, he says, we make this plea. His verbiage changes. We make this plea. Not because we deserve it, but because of your mercy. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. His prayer becomes, we need to be united with God and we need to be united with each other. There's another prayer in the Bible in Romans chapter 15. And it's Paul who wrote the letter to, to the church in Rome. In verse 5, this prayer says, May God who gives this patience and encouragement help you live in complete harmony with each other as is fitting for followers of Christ Jesus. Then all of you can join together with one voice, giving praise and glory to God the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. And because that's the prayer... Therefore, accept each other just as Christ has accepted you so that God will be given glory. He's praying a prayer for unity. He's confessing the need for unity in God's people. I want to end this with giving you three reasons why we need to confess the need for unity. First of all, we're stronger together. We need to pray for unity. We need to confess. We need unity. We need that because we're stronger together. We need unity because we desperately need each other. 
This is the body of Christ. We belong to each other. This is unity, not uniformity. There's a big difference. A lot of times when we talk unity, what we, what we imply is uniformity. In other words, you become just like us. You look just like us. You smell just like us. It's kind of scary sometimes. <laughs> unity and uniformity are different. Unity is many different parts of the body all doing their job as one body. Uniformity is there's a hand and everybody's a hand. That's uniformity. Or there's a big toe and everybody's a big toe. That's uniformity. Unity is, there's diversity, but there's one body with one mission, and that mission is the mission of Jesus Christ, to go make disciples. That's what, what that, and we, we're stronger together when we see unity and not uniformity. Well, they're not like us. Well, they're not, they're not like this. They're not like that. Who cares what you're not like? You be you, and be the best version of you to the glory of God, and serve Him, and be your part of the body. And when those parts work together, we're stronger together. Can, and we, we must confess we need each other. And we're stronger together. Secondly, unity shows God's love to the world. That's what shows God's love to the world, reveals that Jesus is the Savior to the world, is unity. Accept one another as Jesus accepts you. This shows God's love to those who have not accepted it yet. Even skeptics can't argue with the fact when people that don't look like each other get along, when a when anybody knows any history at all sees a Catholic priest and a Lutheran pastor and a Church of God pastor all praying together or serving together, they realize, okay, there's something else going on here besides religious differences. What is that something else? It's God's love. God's love. Put aside your differences and find true unity. Trust me, the world will notice. The world will notice. That's what God's love looks like. And Jesus says... As I have loved you, love one another. This will show the world you're my disciples. That's what he says will show the world you're my disciples. How you love one another. He doesn't say that you, you, how you agree on everything. He doesn't say what, what you put on the sign of your church. He doesn't say how, what your building looks like or how you, how you program your services. He says what will show the world the love of God is how you love each other. So unity shows God's love to the world. And we should pray and confess we need unity, thirdly, because when there's unity, there's a greater capacity to serve others. There's a greater capacity to serve others. And that's what the local church is for. It's not to be a social club. It's to be God's hands and feet to the culture, to the city, to the town, to wherever we are. That's what the purpose of the church, to serve others. The local church is the hope of the world when it's being the church. And we can do so much more to serve when we come together. So as we see pastors praying together, let's also continue to find ways to partner together. Because there's one church. It's God's church. And we can do so much more to serve the community in the name of Jesus together. Confession is not a one-time act, but a lifestyle of seeking God's way. And I'll just kind of leave you with this. Do you have anything you need to confess? Well, I'm not asking you to come and to a little booth and you know say bless me father I have sinned and here's my confessional because we go straight to Jesus but we also if we have something between us and somebody else Jesus is very clear what to do with that you go to your brother and sister or sister and you confess to them and you work it out together with Jesus Christ right in the middle of it do you have anything in your life, any relationships, anything you need to bring in agreement with God? Is there any unconfessed rift in your unity with another member of the body of Christ? Is there any attitude, is there any sin in your life that needs confessed? As you ponder that, I would also ask you, you can respond to that. Please respond to that. Respond to the Holy Spirit of God, not to me. If you'd like for me to pray with you, I would love to. We have kneeling benches and a part of our culture here has been for years and years and years to have an altar call and come and pray. And I would certainly invite you to do that as we sing. But it's not about the bench and it's not about the pastor. It's about your heart and your relationship with Jesus Christ. Come into agreement with God and do it today. As we sing this song, it simply says, Lord, I need you. Every hour I need you. Would you stand as we sing?